Thanks so much. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, super, super happy to be here virtually. Um, you know, so this is my version of the this, uh, Stanford uh, uh, classroom. Um, so this is Columbia's hybrid. We call it high flex uh, teaching setup. So let's see, let's see how it works. Um, so yeah. So um, today. Uh, we, we generally think of accessibility in terms of, uh, in terms of providing access, right? How to make experiences and places uh, possible for people with disabilities. In this talk, I'm going to show how we can go beyond just thinking about accessibility in terms of access and uh, you know, not just making experiences and life possible, but rather uh, making them have a similar or equivalent experience as people without disabilities get to enjoy. So that'll be the subject of this talk. Uh, we're, I'm going to cover two areas, uh, which is one is blind accessible video games. And then the second is audio navigation tools for pedestrian navigation. And the first is going to be informing the second. We're going to draw a lot of um, insights from video games, from virtual spaces, digital spaces, uh, that will help us understand how to make the physical world uh, more navigable um, and, and provide an equivalent experience to people with visual impairments. So my lab, uh, Michael mentioned this already, but my lab is a computer enabled abilities lab. Um, let me just get my clicker uh, on focus here. Here we go. Computer enabled abilities lab um, or SEAL for short. Um, and we uh, are looking to, you know, the type of work that we do is we make it so that computers can grant people abilities, um, the ability to better experience the world. And so uh, there are four threads of, I guess, skills that we employ um, in our research. One is accessibility, of course. Um, second is machine learning. We like to think about like, what, is, what does it mean? Like, like how can you uh, model experiences so that you know that uh, you, know, one, you can say definitively that one person is having an equivalent experience. We look at inputs, for example, controller inputs, um, uh, VR, AR inputs and how we can actually model those prob probabilistically. Uh, we look at games. Uh, we wear a game design hat quite often in our approaches, as you'll see here in this talk. Um, and uh, we do social computing work. Um, quite often, if you ask people, uh, you know, who visually impaired users, uh, people with disabilities, um, you know, just people in general, what do you mo like most value in life? They'll often say like other people. Um, and so social computing is tremendously important if you think about making technology grant people abilities. Um, a lot of the work that I do at SNAP, I'm a research scientist there, SNAP, which makes Snapchat, um, is involved in social computing as well. Um, and so you'll see later we talking, you know, we'll be talking about maps and sharing maps, social computing will come in. Um, so this talk itself is really going to be focusing on the accessibility angle and the games and how, um, and, and the mix between the two. As I mentioned before, we're going to be looking at digital spaces first and how we can make digital spaces equivalently accessible. Um, and then that, those principles will inform our treatment of physical spaces, the real world. Okay, so um, we also tend to, you know, in the lab view computers as being intermediaries. Um, you know, so uh, here's a computer, for example, uh, people's smartphones, um, and they act as intermediaries between people um, and all of the experiences they want to have, everything they want to get out of their lives, right? So whether that's learning, finding jobs, making friends, um, food, all of this stuff, people funnel their attention through computing devices in order to unlock these experiences in real life. Um, and so that powers us, you know, thinking that computers have the power to grant people abilities, but it's a double edged sword. Yes, computers can grant people abilities that they otherwise wouldn't have. And, and that's how a lot of accessibility researchers view uh, assistive technology. But um, computers can also act as gatekeepers. Uh, right, they can hold the keys, hold back the keys uh, to uh, other aspects of the world based on their representation of that world. Uh, and so they can effectively block people from participating in things in an equivalent manner. So that we'll, we'll be looking into that as well. Okay, and so our mantra um, is uh, from making life possible to making life equivalent. Let me show you an example of what I mean in the physical world. So this is a house in Scotland, um, and uh, one of the children uh, uh, needed a wheelchair. And so this family petitioned the town to install a ramp for that child. Um, the town finally did, 
uh, and they installed this. <laughs> this is the ramp right here. Um, and you know, so I'm gonna just show you another angle from the corner here. Um, so you can see the stairs and then there's this ramp on the side. Uh, while this ramp clearly makes it possible to enter and exit that building, um, you know, going up that ramp is certainly not an equivalent experience to just walking straight up those stairs. The only people that would ever use that ramp are people who have to, and that's a problem. So I'll show you another example, physical world. Um, does anyone here know what, uh, what this building is? You can give a hint. Anyone been to this building? It's in Washington, DC. Does that help? So this is so this building is um, the Library of Congress. It's the world lar the world's largest library. And um, the normal route, you know, uh, you know, to enter this building if you don't need a wheelchair uh, is up these stairs right over here through the arches into this grand lobby. Here's another view, here's the stairs. You go up the stairs, you enter under the arches. Absolutely amazing lo uh, lobby, absolutely beautiful. But if you need a wheelchair, then your entrance is not shown anywhere in this, in this image. Actually, you have to go all the way to the end of the block on your right. Um, there's this corner here. This is a Google Maps view. Um, and then you have to enter right here next to the guard booth. Um, make sure that the guard sees that, yes, you're in a wheelchair. Uh, and then you can proceed along the sidewalk into a lower level of the Library of Congress. Um, so again, entering is possible, um, but it's definitely not an equivalent experience. So I just showed two examples from the physical world. Um, this is super, super common in the digital world as well. Uh, and so I'm going to be focusing on games, um, uh, specifically video games. An entire new like genre of games has opened up called audio games. And what audio games are, are um, uh, audio representations of video games. Uh, that it's like a, um, uh, a whole class of games that's made to simulate what the video version of the audio games would otherwise be. Um, interestingly, you might see this glare. There's a building in New Jersey across the river that's perfectly reflecting the sun right now. Um, I can roll down the window or it'll probably end in just a few minutes. Um, so anyway, so this is audio games. Let me show you an example of, um, uh, of some of these audio games. They do not offer the same experience that their respective video game counterparts do. Let me show you an example. So this is Color Crush. Most of you have seen it. Um, and essentially, uh, you, you know, you just have, to, it's a touch screen game, you swap, uh, you know, these, uh, these candies, uh, get three of a kind, and then you, um, and you clear them. So I'll just show some video. Color crush. So there's some color crush action. Everyone's seen color crush. Um, so uh, an audio game version of Color Crush has come out um, by a hobbyist, you know, which is great. It's better than nothing. Um, you know, I, I uh, admire that a lot. Um, but let me show you Blindfold Color Crush. Um, that's what it's called, uh, which is uh, the, the, audio, the audio game equivalent of Color Crush. Just so you can see, if you happen to be blind or visually impaired, you don't get to play this. You're going to play this other game. So here it is. So could you hear that audio, by the way? Sort of, okay. Um, so the sounds um, uh, essentially was just announcing colors as the person swiped um, uh, in, in this, right? So it's saying blue, green, yellow, blue, white, right? This is blindfold color crush. Um, and then I think a, a, a two finger swipe swaps that's, and so this is just a UI view, but the player is, uh, is blind, so they won't, they won't be seeing this. Clearly, this is not the same experience as playing uh, Color Crush, right? Um, clearly not the same. Uh, it's, right, like, uh, you know, Color Crush is a very zen-like um, experience. Um, uh, there's a lot of submission in game design terms. This is all rote, like, memorization. Very, very different type of game. 
So let me show you another example, right? So actually, you know, one point from that from that example is that um, merely providing all of the visual information and conveying that in this audio game uh, clearly doesn't do it. You can't just make sure that the player has all of the audio information. That doesn't quite uh, cut it. So here's another uh, example, which is a game called Top Speed 3. Um, this is a very successful um, and great actual, uh, actually racing game, audio racing game, um, that's designed to give people who are blind um, the ability to play some kind of racing game. Um, so let me just show you some gameplay from Top, top Speed 3. Uh, by show, I mean sound. Um, remember, there are no graphics. Um, let me uh, have you listen to a, a clip of that. And I, it's important that you hear this, so let me just see... Okay, so here's the game. All right, so I think this is the best that we're gonna be able to do in terms of the sound. Okay, yeah, there are no visuals. <laughs> it's, all, it's all sound, unfortunately. Um, okay, so yeah, so, so what you heard, I'll just explain. Um, as, as the game was playing was the game was announcing left, right, left, hard left, easy left, easy right, left, hard left, crash. Um, and so the player's goal there was actually just to react to the turns um, and to react quickly. Um, and, that was, and that essentially was the racing game. But it doesn't really feel like racing, right? There are several problems here. One is that it's just a test of reaction speed naturally. Um, the second is that there's no real track uh, no actual track simulated in the game um, or vehicle physics. It's a very simplified version of a racing game. Um, and so this, you're going to see this time and time again with audio games. Um, and so I'd like to ask the following research question, which is, is it possible to make existing video games blind accessible? Rather than creating this new class of you know, separate and not quite equal games, audio games, can we make existing video games playable by both people who are sighted and people who are blind who want to play that same game? And so uh, just to, you know, move towards this answer, I'm going to present um, a project of mine called the Racing Auditory Display, or the RAD for short. Um, and what this, uh, what this project was, was it was an audio system designed um, to be used for a standard pair of headphones uh, that makes it possible for people who are blind to play the same types of racing games as sighted players can with the same speed and sense of control that sighted players have. Um, and so... So I'll go into the design of this system and, and some of the insights that we got from it. Um, I collaborated on this with my former PhD advisor, uh, Sri Nair um, at, at Columbia. And, but before I do that, let me just, uh, you know, I, I showed Blindfold Color Crush, I showed Top Speed 3, why racing games in particular? Um, we're interested in finding general principles or, or methods for uh, strategies for making uh, games in general blind accessible, right? But we started with racing games, and there are two reasons why. Number one, in a racing game, they're only, uh, you know, it's both easier and harder. Uh, easier and harder. One, it's easier because uh, racing games only have a certain, like a small amount of information um, that the player needs to know and be aware of at any given time. So it's a, it's an easier test, you know, test ground, test bed for that purpose. Um, but then two, it's harder because racing games move. It's really important to communicate that information in real time. The player doesn't get to just like pause, think about things, make another move. You wanna keep it moving so that it feels like racing. You don't even wanna slow the game down because racing is all about speed. So how do you communicate all the information that needs to be communicated um, in real time was a real challenge. So speaking of challenges, right, um, conveying the visual information, that's challenge number one. How do you convey that using uh, sound or, or, you know, not visuals? Um, two, we do that while preserving the game's tempo. It has to be moving at the same speed to still feel like racing. Um, three, even though you're trying to convey a lot of visual information, how do you do that without overwhelming the player with sounds? And four, Last challenge is we wanted to use standard hardware. Uh, no fancy, you know, body-worn stuff. Um, just a regular pair of headphones and maybe the uh, rumble motors within a standard video game controller. 
so that this like solution could be generalized to and, and deployed on consoles and, and PCs. Um, so the reason why we thought that uh, you know that that problem of blind accessible games could be tackled is um, is kind of from wearing our game designers hat. Uh, so in game design, it's um, you know pretty widely known, and this is spoken about at Game Developers Conference all the time. Um, that um, so so a lot of folks, including Mark LeBlanc here, that who I cite, um, ask the question what do players get out of video games? What aspects of games are fulfilling for players? In what ways are people fulfilled by games that they play? So that's what this, this thing is here, which is like eight types of fun. Um, what kinds of fun, if you were to split up that term um, and not make it overloaded, what would that look like in terms of what players are getting out of games? And so that includes things such as discovery, submission, so can, Candy Crush, um, you know, and Color Crush, submission, uh, challenge, fantasy, et cetera. These are, like, this is breaking down in terms of what players get out of games. If you look at these, only one of them is heavily dependent on visuals, and that's sensation. Uh, games as sense pleasure. Uh, where like just pretty graphics or really amazing environments um, themselves can be fun to, to explore and to see, right? Or like, you know, oh, wow, this game, did you feel the, like the, 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 you know, HD haptics, et cetera, HD rumble in that game? That's sensation. Only one is visual. The rest, um, visuals aren't really necessary to any of these things. And that's why, that was the, the key insight here, like, this is why it should be possible to make video games, um, you know, except for sensation, perhaps uh, blind accessible. Okay, so ultimately we wanted to create a, a real racing auditory display, a RAD, some kind of audio system that really feels like racing, so players get that same experience of racing, um, as opposed to one of those top speed type systems, which are just announcing turns, one of these basic auditory displays. Um, uh, there's an obvious analogy which you can guess. So our approach um, to, to making this happen um, is to, as I said with the Library of Congress example, you know, so that's, that's where this comes back, um, is to replicate the experience and not just the visual information. More specifically, uh, experiences are based on meaningful choices that people make. Um, and this is also pretty common knowledge in, in game design, right? Uh, players make meaningful choices from moment to moment, and that constitutes their experience in the game and their feeling of agency when playing the game. And so by replicating the meaningful choices from moment to moment that players are making uh, in terms of the audio cues so that you can design the audio cues such that they give players the same input information um, to make those same decisions, uh, that's, when you, that's the secret sauce. So let me just be a little more um, specific here. So in terms of racing game, our actual approach to solving this problem and making it blind accessible, making it really feel like racing, is to race a whole bunch of laps around the track ourselves and then almost go, you know, go back and watch the replays frame by frame and really analyze from moment to moment, what are we making our, what pieces of information are we making our steering decisions based off of? Um, what is it that we're just, that's making us decide to turn a little bit left, turn right, you know, at, from moment to moment? That is the information that's needed to make those meaningful choices from moment to moment. So it's not important to replicate all of the visual information here, only the information necessary to preserve those meaningful choices, that gameplay. That's the idea. And so it turns out with, with a standard racing game, there are two main uh, choices that a player needs to make, or two uh, rather pieces of information that players make their, base their steering decisions on. Number one is how the race car is situated on the track. Number two is the nature of upcoming turns. And so with the RAD, uh, we designed two audio cues uh, to uh, convey those two separate things. So um, the RAD uh, comprises two audio cues. One is what uh, you know, we call the sound slider, which um, uh, communicates the car's positioning on the track. I'll explain how that works. Uh, and then the second is the turn indicator system, and that, uh, that communicates the nature of upcoming turns. 
So let me talk, I'll talk mostly about the sound slider. It's a little more involved, spend more time here, and then the turn indicator system. Okay, so the sound slider, the way that I like to explain this to, uh, to players is like follows. Imagine that you're sitting directly behind the car that you're controlling so that you hear the sound of the car's engine right in front of your face. As you steer left and right, you're controlling that car, that engine sound directly. So it's going to slide laterally uh, in front of you in the soundscape, in 3D space, um, in, in front of your face. That's the sound slider. Uh, that, that's essentially the concept. Um, but it raises a really uh, interesting sort of research question. Um, if, you, if you peek behind the curtain here, uh, you'll find that uh, we have this situation where, right, the whole point is to communicate the cars, uh, you know, how the car is situated on the racetrack. The car could be pointed any given way. It could be oriented any or, you know, placed any way. The track could be doing a whole variety of things. There's a lot of rich information about how the car is situated here. And we somehow want to use computation to distill that information down to some value of X between zero and one. Um, somehow, uh, it's almost a dimensionality reduction that we're trying to perform. So then the question here for the sound slider is like, what should the value of X be? So one naive approach, um, first take, is um, why, doesn't, why not use X to communicate the car's lateral position on the track? If the car's over here, the slider might move um, you know, to match wherever the car is laterally. So if it's in the middle, it'd be in the middle. If it's kind of on the left edge, be on the left. It's one idea. Um, that idea falls apart a little bit in this situation where you have a straightaway followed by a sharp turn. Essentially, the slider will stay in the middle and then it'll very quickly veer to the right uh, so fast, like too fast for the player to even react to it. Um, so there's a problem with that. And so what that means is that these two situations um, you know, the car being right here at the, at the straightaway versus the car being centered laterally, but right at the precipice of the turn, um, they're actually very different beasts. And so the sound slider should actually communicate these two things differently. Um, same as these two situations, even though these cars are both laterally towards the left, if, as long, once you point the car towards one edge, you have a very different, right? You're in a very different situation. And so maybe the sound slider should reflect that. Ultimately, it's about re the relative risk of hitting either edge of the track. That's the key insight. It's the relative danger here. So for example, right, in this car uh, or in this scenario, what we end up doing is calculate the risk of the car hitting the left or right edge based on the lengths of these trajectories. If the car was to, if the player was to steer left, how long would it take to hit the left edge? And likewise for hitting the right edge. That will represent the car's relative risk of hitting either edge of the track at that point in time. So if we think about that, um, it, we can actually set X to this value, which is just the ratio between these arc lengths. It's pretty, pretty simple here. And so let's go look at these scenarios again. This car that's right in the middle, the arcs have the same length, um, but this car that's on the right, right, the left arc is going to swoop around the turn. It's much longer than the right arc. And so the, it should be communicated very differently. The car is at great risk of hitting the right edge. Same with this scenario. Um, so the left uh, arc is a lot shorter in this case, um, but the left arc is a lot longer in this case. And so we'll be communicating that risk very differently. So that's the sound slider. It's like communicating the positioning of the car on the racetrack in terms of its relative risk of hitting either side. Um, but that will be complemented by the turn indicator system, that other piece of information, which is the nature of upcoming turns. So the way that the turn indicator system works um, is, is, is as follows. So it communicates the uh, direction, the sharpness, the length, and the timing of upcoming turns. Uh, the way that it works, uh, 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 as a player is approaching a turn, they'll hear an announcer uh, announce the number. So for example, they might say eight for turn eight, uh, just to help the player with memory remember the turns. Um, and then at the same time, they'll hear a series of four beeps 
from either from either ear. It'll sound like woo, 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 coming from one side or the other. Um, if it's a right turn, it'll come from the right side. If it's a left turn, it'll come from the left side. The, um, the pitch of the beeps uh, indicates the sharpness of the turn. And we, uh, you know, we have three different turn sharpnesses. Um, the reason there are four beeps is that they establish a rhythm so that uh, the turn itself will always start on the fourth beep. So as the player approaches the turn, they know exactly the, when the turn is going to start. They know the timing. And then that last beep, that continues sounding as long as the player is, is in the turn. So, so that's how the, the, sounds, uh, the turn indicator system works. And so together, the sound slider and the turn indicator system actually uh, uh, support the following actions in, in the racing game. Um, they help the player understand their current speed, learn the layout of the track, cut corners, um, position the car for an optimal turn, even advanced maneuvers such as choosing an early or a late apex. You can do all of these things with just those two audio cues. Um, and in fact, we had uh, uh, people who, are, who have been blind their entire lives try out um, the RAD. And by the third lap, they were able to actually uh, do a lot of these advanced stuff, like cut corners and, and, and things like that. So I think next up, I'm going to show a quick um, video of the RAD in action. I'm going to move and try to move my personal lapel mic uh, closer to the sound source so you can hear it. So you weren't hearing stereo, but it's, a, it's stereo, sound is spatialized. Um, and then I'll play a short clip from that player uh, describing um, his experience uh, playing a, a racing game, a real racing game for the first time. So that particular player was blind, uh, has been blind from birth. Um, sorry, before that, a couple data points. That's coming after the data. Um, in terms of lap times, uh, we actually found that the RAD um, offered, uh, you know, players were able to, to drive laps in uh, a comparable amount of time as sighted casual players. Um, and then in like in shorter times than a system that just called out turn left, turn right, left, right. That's what the red thing is. Um, and then the, this one chart before I show that other video, um, it, here are some actual driving paths. Uh, so the rad is in blue, uh, and then the turn left, right, left kind of system is in red, as you see. And you can see that the rad allows the player to actually make some advanced racing maneuvers, right? So like obviously they're going straighter along this straightaway, but then they can thread the needle um, in this S turn, uh, for example. And this was after just using the rad for a few laps. They're able to uh, form that intuition of what's going on with the track. Okay, so here's the video. It was interesting to try the RAD because of the, the new experience that it gave to me as a visually impaired person um, in relation to playing uh, racing games. This feeling of, I guess you can say the feeling of adventure that it gave, the sense of control that it gave me as a player um, was totally different than what you would usually get from uh, other audio racing games that were specifically designed for uh, the visually impaired community. So um, the sound slider and the turn indicator system have some implications, um, uh, you know, beyond games um, to HCI in general. Um, so for example, like in a pedestrian navigation system, uh, they can actually be used to help people who are blind um, uh, walk along a path and not only just walk, follow a straight line along the path, but understand the path's width and maybe keep to the right side of that path. Uh, the way that sound sliders are defined, they're essentially these line segments in, in 3D space in the soundscape. They could be used to as slider displays in general, in general purpose UIs. Um, and then they can be used for uh, any kinds of uh, steering tasks in the classical sense. Um, to help some kind of, uh, you know, user make a motion through some type of path or tunnel. 
Cool. So um, that work, the, the racing auditory display, um, showed us that in order to enable meaningful experiences, it's important to preserve uh, meaningful choices, right? Um, and so rather like in order to enable equivalent experiences, it's important to preserve meaningful choices. Um, but the rat only scratched the surface. Um, racing games is just one game genre. There are a lot of other genres such as um, platforming games, uh, action games, adventure games, RPGs, first person shooters, et cetera. Um, and then also the RAD uh, sort of revealed the prospect of, um, with the pedestrian navigation stuff, uh, promoting real world navigation as well and helping people better understand the real world as they're navigating as well. Um, and so this is work that we're, that's still in progress um, that we are doing in order to investigate both of those, uh, both of those realms. Um, new genres of games. So in this case, this is an adventure game, an action adventure game. Um, and then how do we, uh, you know, so how do we build uh, tools, widgets that can be used across games and maybe built into uh, game engines uh, to make these types of games playable? And then can those same widgets also give people more fulfilling experiences navigating in the real world? So they're not just following orders. So that's this, that's this project. Um, this is the kind of game that I'm talking about. Um, there's no sound here, uh, but just to illustrate this, you know, this action adventure game, you can move around, you can break crates. Every, every great game has to have crates, um, some enemies you can melee, uh, you can also fire projectiles, um, that kind of things. Okay, so this, um, this project was led by Vishnu Nair, uh, my first PhD student. Um, he's a second year now, uh, and then and as well a team of uh, undergraduate and master's students at Columbia. So let me start by uh, talking about audio navigation today um, in the real world. Uh, and it, it actually works the same way in existing uh, like adventure games and first person shooters. Generally, uh, these audio navigation tools act as guides that users must follow. So the prevailing analogy is that of a guide dog where um, there's some kind of sound or some kind of tool that tells the user which way to go and they just follow it. Uh, wherever they're going, right? That's the analogy. And so um, few common approaches. One is this concept of audio beacons. Um, it's, it's present in this system called SWAN from Georgia Tech, Microsoft Soundscape, which is a really, really cool uh, free uh, mobile app. Um, and the way that it works is that you essentially, the user hears this audio beacon, a siren call, um, using spatialized sound from some point in space. They rotate themselves to center the sound and walk towards it. Uh, once they do that, another sound will appear. They turn, they rotate, and walk towards that one. Um, and then they're just guided along a polyline, some route uh, to their destination. So that's, that's audio beacons. So this is how... Um, people who are blind, if they want to use an audio system such as Microsoft Soundscape to, uh, to navigate to, to some place, that's, that's how they do it. Another approach is um, NavCog. So NavCog came out of uh, Carnegie Mellon and IBM. Um, and so rather than using audio beacons, they're using uh, NavCog employs spoken prompts, which tells the player um, or the, the, the user, uh, you know, walk 50 meters, turn left in 10 meters, okay, turn left now, keep turning, keep turning, okay, that kind of thing. So here I'm just going to play this short video so you can hear what some of these prompts sound like. I'll step over here. Turn around, you might be going backward. Proceed 25 meters and turn right. Okay, so that's NavCog, spoken directions instead of beacons. And then third, we're seeing really interesting work. This is again from uh, CMU um, called Cabot. And this really um, you know, uh, goes into this guide dog analogy. Um, what we have here is a suitcase that um, can, can uh, move itself along and it has a depth camera attached to it. Uh, and so this suitcase will actually guide the user um, and the user simply just kind of follows the suitcase. And it also checks for obstacles along the way. So here's a quick little video of Cabot. So it's kind of tugging the user along, it's kind of dragging the user along. But 
Our observation is that, if, again, when we, you know, thinking about equivalent experiences, people who are sighted, um, you know, do not, it, you know, navigation is not just about getting from place from point A to point B efficiently, right? It's about a lot more. It's not just about closing your eyes and having someone take you there. Okay, you have arrived. It's about a lot more than that. Um, it's about surveying one's surroundings, kind of knowing where they are, um, enjoying the space itself, the journey along the way, understanding how items are arranged in a space, forming mental maps, cognitive maps of the space, right? It's about a lot more than search, uh, this idea of just going from point A to point B. And so, um, in short, navigation is about looking around. And so if you really, if there's one ability that can unlock, um, you know, agency and navigation, um, it's the ability to look around. If you can provide that well, uh, then actually people, uh, users would be able to navigate themselves in a very fulfilling way rather than just being guided. And so NavStick is an instrument for looking around. Um, and the way that it works, and, and so far we've prototyped it for games, is it repurposes the right analog stick into an instrument for looking around. Essentially, the user sim uh, will tilt the stick in order to look around in that direction with respect to them. So if you tilt it to the right, you're checking out your three o'clock. If you tilt it forward, it's your 12 o'clock. So you can very, very quickly survey what's around you as you go in the game. Um, most adventure games and first person shooters uh, reserve the right stick for camera controls. Uh, but if you're blind, you don't need the camera. Uh, so we can repurpose it into an instrument for looking around. Um, it's a simple idea, uh, but uh, what's interesting about this idea is that it enables uh, on demand. Uh, on demand and random access to directional information. It's on demand because users aren't just being spoken to the entire time, especially when they don't want to hear speech or hear that siren sound. The only time that they'll ever hear a sound is when they, when they tilt the stick. They get to control that. Um, and it's random access because they can, they can probe any direction just by tilting the stick in that direction. There's constant time to, to look around, no matter, regardless of direction. So here I'm going to show NavStick in uh, a uh, grocery store environment that we created. I'll explain why we created this grocery store in a, mi in, in a minute. It's essentially uh, to um, test NavStick not only in that adventure game context, but also in the context of real world navigation, thinking about uh, environments in which people might want to find things and explore and remember where things are and compare items. That's the grocery store. Um, so here's NavStick in action. I'm going to move so you can actually hear. <laughs> okay, so that was a quick one. And so we asked a few research questions around NavStick, giving people this ability to look around in spaces, um, which, which surprisingly isn't present right now. Um, number one, how well does NavStick facilitate different navigation tasks or purposes? Right? So by navigation tasks, I mean search, getting from point A to point B, but also exploration, forming cognitive maps, or comparison, comparing different pathways. We draw from, uh, from psychology here in terms of right, the purposes that, uh, you know, navigation being an overloaded term, and there are actually many different purposes for navigation. So we want to we wanna understand how well NavStick serves these different purposes, if it is going to become an instrument for navigation, a widget that we use across UIs. Um, two, we want to understand how well does NavStick facilitate different navigation environments? Um, so game environments, clutter, density, occlusion, that kind of thing. And then three, how does NavStick compare to menu-based surveying? This idea of just having a hierarchical menu of, of um, targets that people can select, grocery store items, for example, um, and you know, maybe it's alphabetized or sorted by distance. So I'll show just a couple of results here. Um, and number two, by the way, how well does NavStick facilitate in different environments? This is still in progress. Um, and uh, uh, we're testing this in that video, that adventure video game uh, environment. 
So we had six different navigation tasks. I won't go into this, um, but essentially we talked about ex exploration, search, comparison, and uh, even playing games where agency is more important in navigation. By directional, I mean cases in which knowing the direction of something is important. So for example, I want to remember that the milk is in this corner of the aisle as opposed to just in the aisle period. Um, and this is like this video game environment. Another one, this is, an act, this is actually a first person shooter um, that we uh, recreated. And we found that um, participants um, actually enjoy having both a menu based navigation tool uh, to get from point A to point B and Navstick to explore and look around. And they make that choice based on whether they would like to navigate directionally, uh, whether direction's important, and whether or not um, they are, for example, playing a game. And in the context of a game where people um, predominantly preferred Navstick, they preferred this, even though they also agreed that Navstick took a lot of extra effort um, for the game, actually looking around and doing things themselves was the whole point of the game uh, to them. Uh, they really enjoyed that a lot. So I'm going to um, show one more result about mental maps. Um, people actually felt that they were able to form uh, better mental maps of their spaces with Navstick compared to using a menu and hearing where these things are from a menu. Um, and they, they agreed, very small confidence interval. And then we quizzed them. We put them in random grocery store aisles and say, you know, and said, okay, so where's the peanut butter? Um, and we found that people performed much better uh, when they were able to explore first with Navstick than when they used a menu. Okay, so let me go on into future work. Okay. So in the future, um, um, you know, the, the way that, that uh, you know, we're thinking about the next couple of years and, and accessibility at large uh, is, is related to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? So this is how I think about accessibility. Um, Maslow's hierarchy starts with basic needs on the bottom, food, water, shelter, that kind of thing, safety needs, um, and then it moves on up into self-fulfillment needs, achieving one's full potential, including creative activities, right? Um, if you look at most accessibility research today, um, it's down here at the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, really focused on just providing basic access, making things possible, fulfilling basic needs. Right. Um, you might think of it in terms of actually this this wedge where we're fulfilling these basic needs and a lot of um, accessibility work is trying to figure out other basic needs that that um, that need to be fulfilled. It's a continuing journey. Um, so we're kind of just expanding outward in accessibility research. Um, but we. Uh, at, at the lab, like and, and this is and this is also what I believe, uh, think that the future is in agency. Right, accessibility, accessibility system shouldn't just be building outward and serving more basic needs. Of course, that's super important, but we need to be thinking about creating equivalent experiences as well and not you know, creating these glass ceilings for users, right? So the future is building up. Um, in New York, we like to build up. Uh, and so I think, uh, and, and so we're doing a lot of work um, in terms of uh, helping people have these equivalent experiences and, and the sense of agency and self-worth and this feeling of, yes, I did it, instead of I'm just following the system's orders. And so with Navstick, um, you know, this is ongoing work again. I showed you the team. Um, we uh, actually prototyped Navstick in this video game, allowing users to, you know, shoot enemies, walk around. We're doing a whole bunch of experiments there. Uh, we'll be releasing stuff. Um, we want to make all this stuff open source. Here's a top-down view of the kinds of stuff we're doing with Navstick in adventure games and moving on to other genres of games. Um, we're also thinking about how uh, to very quickly communicate the shapes of rooms and layouts to people um, using sound, right? You walk into a room or a hallway, if you have sight, you can very quickly perceive the general, this general sense of shape. How can we do that uh, without sight? And then my other PhD student, Garov Jane, um, is leading a project which we're called, uh, calling Wearable Vision. He has a computer vision background, working with several uh, you know, really talented undergrads and master's students, um, in which uh, a user can actually uh, create their own maps by wearing a little camera harness. So Garov is a first year PhD student. 
so this is still pretty early work, but essentially we're um, uh, using SLAM and uh, the idea is like how do we give blind users um, the power to take navigation and like map making into their own hands rather than relying on building owners to install maps and Bluetooth hardware and all of that themselves. How can uh, blind users take map making and localization into their own hands by creating their own spots um, and, and making SLAM work for humans and not just robots at factories, right? There are a lot of human factors and UI issues, especially if the user's blind. How do they actually control? How do, how do you build this kind of system? So this is a... Uh, um, uh, my, you know, this is part of a floor um, near my office. Um, Gaurav, I think, just did one loop and formed this map and created these little spots along the way. We're also going to, we're looking into this idea, going into social computing, of sharing maps. So if I, for example, created a map of uh, my office building and then I have a visitor um, who's blind, I can say, oh, I have a map for that, being, right? Um, or maybe there's kind of an open street map um, or a project sidewalk um, for this sort of thing. Okay, and one last word, this is my last thing, um, about this slide about how accessibility relates to HCI that I'd like to say. Um, accessibility, I feel, is like very um, central to HCI because it forces us to think of what's really necessary and what's really needed. Um, in the systems that we build, right? Like what is the core components? Um, we, we have to stay grounded when we think about accessibility issues. Um, but going forward, uh, I think that like, you know, we should be thinking in terms of not just what's really needed, um, but in terms of equity. Like how can we, like in all of these great systems that we build, um, how do we make sure that we're not just making life possible for other people, um, but equitable for other people? Okay, so thank you so much um, for listening and uh, happy to take any questions. Sorry for the high flex classroom, um, you know, audio issues. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> no worries. The joys of, of uh, Zoom and, and <laughs> yeah. brave new world. Uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, the, uh, so this is a good a chance for, for questions. The, uh, there's a form that I've linked to in the Zoom chat that you can ask. Panelists, feel free to just go ahead and unmute yourselves and, and dive in. Um, did you want to start? And then while I curate uh, questions from the, from, the, from the form? Sure. If I look um, this way, this is my view of the computer. I can see the gallery here. So, yeah. <laughs> OK, cool. Um, I was a little curious about how you're thinking about playtesting. Um, so normally, you do many, many, many rounds. And, but of course, it can be difficult to bring in participants. So I was wondering, just sort of, do you do it yourself? Do you wear a blindfold? <laughs> you know, because I yeah. saw that you used them in the last cycle, but that's really kind of late. Yeah, let me, yeah I, um, thanks for the question. Yeah, let me actually make that clear. So um, during development and like, you know, we're coding something, does it work? Like we do wear blindfolds ourselves just to get a basic feel for things. But we also host um, uh, students in the lab, uh, particularly people with visual impairments. So I have relationships, one of the, like, so uh, several different, you know, national organizations for, um, you know, serving blind users uh, are headquartered here in New York. Um, and so I have relationships with them. Uh, we have, um, you know, they sit alongside us. Uh, so we co-design with these users. Um, we host over the summer as well. Uh, and so we've actually learned a lot more from them um, as they've learned from us. Um, and, uh, and, and so that's how we do things. So like when it comes to just like debugging something, do I think this, you know, you're coding, it's nighttime, um, you know, do I think this is going to work? Yeah, we'll wear a blindfold, we'll try it out. And, and we've learned to have some kind of intuition for that because we've been in this space for a while. Um, but ultimately, uh, you know, co-design is what, what does that for us. Absolutely. Um, and I'm gonna sneak one more in. Have you explored echolocation? Yes, echolocation, I find it super interesting. Um, it takes, yeah, like I, I think we, um, at least in that, that project that I showed about communicating room shape, um, that's actually what we're looking at uh, most. And like different, and different techniques for um, generating echolocated sounds. That's actually the space that we're exploring. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. thanks. 
other panelists, do you want to jump in? If not, we have questions from uh, from attendees as well. Yeah, um, Brian, I'm curious. It seems like most of what you talked about was auditory, but your last few examples made me wonder if um, touch approaches, um, either a braille oriented, you know, bump thing or a vibration thing with, you know, a little pad that could be scrolled and zoomed and whatnot is also a valuable approach. And if you're doing anything with it. Yeah, yeah, I'm really interested in touch as well. And it, like, just like you said, a braille sort of thing, um, you know, dealing with um, limited human sensory resolution, that's a major challenge, um, as well as like speed of, of motors, right? Um, actually making the haptics work. I think for general purpose navigation, real world environments, they'll work just fine. For games, especially when the games are very fast, I found that to be a limitation um, in some of the uh, you know, me just like trying things out. Um, but I think um, to be perfectly honest, uh, one of the uh, obstacles that we've had is um, uh, I'm not working with any students, like neither of my PhD students and, and myself, like we, we aren't into hardware ourselves. Um, and so that's actually an area that we're looking to collaborate in um, is like, how can we uh, think about haptics, design haptics, uh, and also think about multimodal solutions, um, audio and haptics. Um, yeah, and, and, and especially if there's some general purpose devices that users can buy, like you buy this one thing and it can, you know, uh, give you a lot in terms of, you know, real world navigation in many contexts. Um, I, I love that idea. Um, I, I have a question. Um, in the biofeedback space, um, specifically with haptics, for example, or even auditory feedback, there's a lot of discussion on the need for personalization that it's different how the level of comfort um, for that feedback for different people or even the mental models they have for that feedback. Do you think about personalization or how do you go about that since so much of the work you're doing is conveying all this information through auditory channels? Yeah, I, I think that that um, just, uh, you know, reasserts the importance of multimodal. Um, I think like I found it just, you know, uh, a lot of the uh, visually impaired folks that I've worked with and, and, and spoken to, um, some of them are really into sound. Some of them also, many of them actually have hearing impairments, even slight ones that make sound uh, work, you know, much less effectively for them. Um, and they'd really prefer haptics. Uh, some don't like haptics. And so I think that uh, we should be aiming to design solutions in both sound and haptics. Um, and allow users to kind of choose and mix and match. Hey, Brian, nice to see you. Hi, um, nice to see you. Uh, I had a couple of questions that, uh, you know, hopefully won't take too much time, so maybe I can do two. Um, the first question I had was whether you've looked at whether these kinds of tools also help sighted people, because it seems to me like having this kind of extra feedback, you know, extra in the case of someone who's sighted would maybe like improve their experience of a game. And I think that's often the case when we design more accessible techniques and tools that actually everyone benefits. Um, so that's just sort of one question, although obviously that's not the focus, and nor should it be. Uh, and the other question I have is how you think about um, the trade-off or the tension between learning something new that might, you know, provide someone with a skill set that's going to, you know, with the time investment to learn is going to provide them a lot of benefit versus Sort of speed of adoption which makes some um, you know in the case of uh, a racing game it's really cool if someone can within a few laps be totally proficient at it but also you know if it's sort of a more advanced or a more difficult technique you know maybe speed of adoption is not really the right metric because it might take longer to pick up but then actually be like more effective in the long term so i'm just thinking about how you evaluate your tools and think about that trade-off yeah so um super quick answer to both to both questions regarding um uh, so I'll, I'll answer the, the second one first about adoption. Um, I think, again, that's where personalization is important, right? Um, and, and that begs for future work, right? So if you have one technique that does more or less, you know, well, um, but you can learn it quickly, and another one that, like, works really, really well, but it takes a while to learn, is that effort worth the cost? It's kind of like learning a new keyboard layout. Um, that just begs further research. And so I think that the jury's still out on that. 
Um, but in terms of your other question, like for, uh, you know, people who don't have visual impairments, like how can these systems benefit uh, sighted people? Um, I think about this every time I go to Penn Station <laughs> downtown, and that's actually one of the reasons why I'm really, um, I, I, uh, um, if I had to choose, like, I, I choose audio um, because uh, it's so easy to incorporate into earbuds. Um, and so I think there's a lot of potential to, um, to help uh, people who are sighted just with earbuds that they would always like normally uh, have in their ears anyways. Um, yeah, especially grocery stores, that, that topic comes up all the time as well. All right, and I will be the, the audience surrogate uh, for the folks who submitted through the, through the form. We definitely had several questions that you've touched on. Um, most, most of them had to do with haptic feedback as a, as a channel. So certainly a lot of excitement around that. Um, also asked a question about what are the most difficult genres to make accessible? How do you overcome these problems? Maybe a, a way to conceptualize that question would be to ask, you know, what seems what seems on the possibility horizon and then what kinds of experiences and, and fulfillments seem, you know, capital H hard that, you know, that there are fundamental blockers there that you see. Yeah. So the, regarding the blockers, like I think um, if you go, if you look back to that eight types of fun slide, one type was sensation games is sense pleasure, any games that really hinge on sensation, that's capital H hard. Um, and so, uh, you know, color crush, candy crush, all of those variants, of, of the same type of game, right? They, um, uh, those, those are mostly su uh, submission, um, but the mechanic of uh, quickly identifying swappable uh, gems or candies or whatnot um, is highly, highly, highly visual. Um, and, and so that I would say that's getting closer to capital H hard. Um, first person shooters, um, I think very doable. Uh, platforming games, um, uh, time pressure is so immense, um, but I think the the real obstacle is the games that re that rely on sensation. And does this? Some of these examples seem to be because our visual system often operates in parallel, but our audio system, you know, like these, like if you get the two different uh, sound streams, it's hard to track them both simultaneously. Is is that what's going on here? Yeah, that's that's exactly what's going on. So not only does the visual uh, system, you know, operate in parallel in many different ways, but it also just has a much higher throughput in general. Um, and so you're kind of losing both ways with audio compared to visual channel. Okay. All right. Then uh, I think that's what we got. Let's thank our speaker one more time. And uh, Thank you for joining us remotely from a classroom in New York City. We all wish we could be there. Uh, and we wish you could be here too. Thanks. Thank you so Thank much you for joining so much us. Fun. Yeah, I, I had a blast. Thanks so much.